My name is Peter Binder, and I'm a senior here at Loris College. And as the sort of title of my presentation, I chose the very first two words of that hymn that you just heard, Vexila Regis, which means the banners of the king. When looking in the books, it's kind of surprising what a prominent place it's given. You've already heard in some of the other presentations just how expensive and how time-consuming the production of these books was. And so it comes as a sort of surprise that this hymn is actually given in two different settings in the books. There's two different sets of music which go along with the text. There's the one which you just heard, which comes out of a Hispanic chant tradition, the Mozarabic tradition. And then there's also a second setting, which uh, comes out of the Roman chant tradition. So it's really surprising that they would include two of these in these books. And this hymn was pretty prominent in the monastic liturgy. They would have sung it at their vespers, at evening prayer, in the days leading up to the Triduum for about a week and a half during Passion Tide. And then once the hymns went silent, once the Triduum started, it would have been sung again during the Good Friday liturgy. This uh, hymn would have been sung while the sacrament is taken from the altar of deposition where it's stored to the main altar. It's the returning of the body of Christ to the church in the Good Friday liturgy. And it was removed in the Holy Week reforms of 1955 and replaced by some antiphons and now has completely gone away. Uh, all that music has gone away in the more modern uh, reform. But despite its role in these liturgies, we have to ask what sort of uh, experience would the singing of this hymn give the monks? What would they take away from singing this hymn both in those days leading up to their highest holy days and also seeing it on the day in which they celebrated the passion of the Lord? And I think we can take away two emphases. These are not the only emphases, but they're the ones I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the text con explains Christ as Messiah and Christ as victor. So we'll start with Christ as Messiah. And I'd like to read just one of the verses of the hymn. Fulfilled are the things which David sung in a faithful song, saying in the nations, God hath reigned from a tree. So we're going to be using this verse to talk about Christ as Messiah. And what does that mean in these liturgies? It means that Christ is the fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies. And this understanding of Christ as the fulfillment of these prophecies was extremely important in the Good Friday liturgy, even from a very long time ago. This definitely would have been something that the monks would have really appreciated and they would have experienced. We can see just how early the appreciation for these prophecies came in from the itinerarium of Egeria. Egeria was a, a fourth century abbess who went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and wrote her diary about all the stuff she saw. And it's our main resource for liturgical information about the church in Jerusalem in the 300s. So she talks about how on Good Friday, they would have venerated the cross until the sixth hour, which is noon. And then scripture and other things are read. Her saying, thus from the sixth to the ninth hours, the lessons are so read and hymns said that it may be shown to all the people that whatsoever the prophets foretold of the Lord's passion is proved from the gospels and from the writings of the apostles to have been fulfilled. So we can already see this strong appreciation and strong emphasis for Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament as early as the 300s, and that carries on in the Good Friday structure that these Spanish monks would have experienced. They would have, as part of their liturgy on Good Friday, read from Hosea, read the prophecies there, read from Habakkuk, read from Exodus, and read from the Psalms before they finally would have turned to the gospel and chanted the Passion, seeing how all the things which had been foretold of Christ as Messiah were fulfilled in the Passion. And there's also a rather interesting textual side note which I'd like to talk about. This last phrase here, 
um, in the hymn, Dicens in Nationibus Regnavit Aligno Deus, which is saying in the nations, God hath reigned from a tree. This isn't found in the Bible, at least in the version of the Psalter that we use. The author of the hymn, Venantius Fortunatus, who is alive in the 500s, was probably working with the Psalterium Romanum. So there's multiple Latin translations of the Psalter, of the Psalms in the Bible. And like all manuscripts, those are going to have different variations and slight differences, which the people back then would have been very attuned to because of their knowledge of these different manuscripts. So in the Psalterium Romanum, which Venantius Fortunatus, the composer of the hymn, probably was using, it directly says, Dicite nationibus dominus regnavit aligno. Say to the nations, the Lord hath reigned from a tree. And so he's almost directly quoting Psalm 95 when he's writing this hymn. Now, if we look at the Clementine Vulgate or any other Latin version, um, it doesn't have that phrase aligno. There is no from the tree. It just says, say to the nations, for the Lord hath reigned. And this reading of Aligno is a very old tradition. Um, it's found first in Justin Martyr, who was writing in the 100s. It's found in Tertullian. It's found in Cyprian. It's found in Augustine and Jerome. And Jerome, although he found it in this Latin Psalter, he couldn't find it in any Hebrew tradition. He couldn't find it in any of the Greek manuscripts he had except for one. And so he left it out. But we can see just the emphasis on these different textual traditions, the intertextualities uh, contained in this hymn, and how this emphasis on Christ as the fulfillment is really important. Because the monks, even if they wouldn't have known the reading aligno, they would have definitely recognized this phrase, saying in the Dacians, God hath reigned, as directly quoting a psalm, because they recited them daily. Now, unfortunately, this verse was removed from the hymn. You won't find it in modern liturgical books after the reform of 1971, probably because of this intertextuality, but I think it loses some of its really interesting meaning and scriptural emphasis when we lose this verse. I'd a second like to talk about how we can see Christ as victor. When we think about Good Friday, which is the day on which Christians celebrate the Lord's suffering um, and death, that sounds like a really depressing event and just very sad. And you can sort of see that in all the different devotions that rose up around on Fridays. You'd have the seven last words of Christ. You'd have the stations of the cross. You'd have all these different things to really emphasize the sorrow. But in the actual liturgy, we get sort of a different mode, a different mood from especially this hymn. I'll read another two verses. The banners of the king go forth, the banners of the vexilla. The mystery of the cross shines out, on which Gippet, the creator of the flesh in flesh, has been suspended. Tree, beautiful and shining, this is referring to the cross, having been furnished with the purple of the king, chosen as the worthy trunk to touch such holy limbs. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious that there's a lot of emphasis on Christ as having ruled. He's triumphed. He's the victor here, just from our language of the king. Uh, but there's a lot more going on underneath the text, and a lot of that comes from the background of the author, Venantius Fortunatus. He, as a child, received a classical education in Ravenna. This was the holy, the Roman Empire had mostly fallen, but it was still sort of around, and they definitely still had appreciation for the Latin classics. Uh, Fortunatus would have learned Horace, he would have learned Virgil, he would have learned all the great classical poets in this classical education. And eventually he uh, went around writing poetry before moving to Poitiers um, and being uh, patronized by St. Radegund, who was the abbess of the Monastery of the Holy Cross in Poitiers. She was also Queen of the Franks and a Thuringian princess, but 
So Fortunatus composed this hymn and another one, the Pange Lingua, for a major event. St. Radigund had managed to get the uh, Byzantine emperor, Justin II, to center a piece of the Holy Cross, and that's a big deal. So there's going to be this massive reception ceremony. You would have bishops, you'd have um, kings, you'd have princes, all there to process the relic into the monastery. You'd probably have literally everyone in Poitiers come out for this event. So she needed some hymns. And Fortunatus heavily turns to the sort of education that he received, the classics. So when he uses this phrase, vexilo regis, why is he referring to the cross, which we can assume he's referring to, as a vexila, as a banner? And surprisingly, this imagery isn't original to Fortunatus. He's actually drawing on an earlier uh, Christian hymnodist, Prudentius, who lived in the 300s. And he's particularly referencing Prudentius's Da Puer Plectrum. So I'll just read a verse that is particularly important. Loose mind, the sonorous voice, loose the moving tongue, tell the tropeon, the trophy of the passion, tell the triumphant cross, Sing the banner, the vexilum, that shines on marked foreheads. So you can see as early as the 300s, Prudentius is already transforming the cross into this triumphant symbol. It's a banner of the king that shines on the marked foreheads. And that's a reference to uh, confirmation to those baptized in those liturgies. But there's more here. The da puer plectrum and also uh, Fortunatus' own Pange Lingua, which he wrote for this event, are composed as trochaic tetrameter catalectic poems, which is a really fancy way of describing the meter that these poems are written in. And this trochaic tetrameter catalectic had a venerable, well, sort of venerable history in the classical learning. It was uh, used for triumphant military processions. So you can imagine the Roman or Greek general coming in after a big triumph. He's entering Rome with all his soldiers, and the soldiers would be singing a song of uh, rejoicing and triumph written in this meter, and they really cared about meter back then. Um, and so that meter would have signified a sort of triumphant military procession. <clears throat> Second, uh, Prudentius uses the word tropeon, tropeon passionis, the trophy of the passion, and this word is also used in uh, Fortunatus' uh, Pange Lingua, and we can certainly see it, understand it, once we talk about what the tropeon was. The tropeon was a really old Greek and Roman custom to set up a tree after a big victory. They would set up a tree, or probably just a big stump, as a monument to commemorate the victory, and the tree often had a cross piece as well. But this tropeon would commemorate these military victories, and so when Fortunatus talks about the tree beautiful and shining, being furnished with the purple, or perhaps the crimson blood of the king, he's referencing this old, very old, custom of setting a tree after a victory. And so we can sort of see this entire ceremony of venerating the cross and these things, which perhaps the monks weren't always aware of, but it's certainly that mood would have been passed down through the ages and even the basic text. The monks would have seen both venerating the cross and of processing with the sacrament, not as a funerary march accompanied by a dirge, but as a triumphant solemnity, honoring the king who has bought the victory, the redeemer of the world who, to use a phrase of Fortunatus's, being sacrificed, conquered. So to sum up, I've sort of talked about the different things that the monks and the monastic community would have experienced just in this hymn, which was deemed so important 
to have two different musical settings in these expensive to produce books. We've talked about how Christ was the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and how Christ was the victor, triumphantly having conquered death and having won his people for his own. And I hope this at least gives some, some idea of what the atmosphere and what the understanding of Good Friday would have been in this Spanish monastery.